History is being erased from the internet. Mr. Reagan. Valeria has said that this is a boring topic and no one will watch this video. And she's probably right. But darn it, I spent three days researching all this crap and you're gonna listen. <laughs> Seriously though, this is a really big problem that nobody knows about. So this is a pretty important video. Now I'm putting all this, all of my videos on Spotify and Apple Podcasts these days. So if you prefer listening on those services, please check those out. All right, let's get started. In Illinois the other day, state leaders called for the abolishment of history classes in Illinois schools. This is insane. But we know leftists are crazy, so it's not that surprising. Allow me to read the press release. This is truly unbelievable. Concerned that current school history teaching leads to white privilege and is and a racist society, State Representative LaShawn K. Ford, Democrat of Chicago, will join local leaders today at noon at the Robert Crown Center in Evanston to call on the state to stop its current history teaching practices until approved alternatives are developed. When it comes to teaching history in Illinois, we need to end the miscommunication of Illinoisans, Ford said. I'm calling on the Illinois State Board of Education and local school districts to take immediate action by removing current history books and curriculum practices Good Lord. That unfairly communicate our history until a suitable alternative is developed. We should instead devote greater attention towards civics and ensuring students understand our de democratic processes and how they can be involved. Apparently, they want to create more left-wing political activists. That's just great. It goes on. I'm also alarmed that people continue to display symbols of hate, such as the recent display of the Confederate flag at Evanston. The miseducation of our children must stop, said Malika Gardner of we will. It is urgent that it comes to an end as we witness our current climate become more hostile. Misinformation has fed and continues to feed systemic racism for generations. If black history continues to be devalued and taught incorrectly, then it will call for further action. Okay, now things get way worse than this. And I fell down a rabbit hole the last few days. That was one of the craziest rides I've been on in a while. I'll lead you through it in just one moment. First, I have to sell you something. How far will your US dollar go once we tally up the debt accumulated in the fight against coronavirus? How will government mandated business shutdowns affect the economy moving forward? My friends, uncertainty is the enemy of investors and savers alike, and we must all guard against this uncertainty. No one is expected to know the future, and diversification is the proper strategy to combat market instability and geoeconomic uncertainty. Now is the time to take action to protect yourself and to protect your financial future. Did you know it took nearly eight years for the markets to recover after the 2008 crash? Yet gold and silver surged to all-time highs. U.S. investors can use a little-known IRS-qualified loophole that allows Americans to buy gold and silver as tangible assets through their accredited retirement accounts. Give the good guys at Orion Metal Exchange a call to see what you can do to protect your retirement account. Bank of America and Citigroup both see gold soaring, forecasting $2,000 and $3,000 an ounce for gold, respectively. Some experts are calling for gold to double in the next year. Call 866-915-5053 and get your free investment guide today. Mention the Mr. Reagan YouTube channel and ask for details on how you can qualify for their current IRA account incentives. At Orion, you get more metal for your money. Now this seems pretty outrageous, but in a way, I agree with the crazy people here criticizing history classes. History classes are poisoning the minds of American students, but not in the way these people are saying. History classes in America seem slanted way too far the other direction. I remember as a kid constantly being force-fed anti-slavery films and lessons about the civil rights movement. This was the 1980s in Oregon. I remember seeing this stuff from like probably like the third grade. It was relentless. And let me just say this, showing a bunch of dirty barefoot black people running away from fat angry southerners never really made me like black people any more than I already did. I can't imagine that this is the most effective technique to stop people being racist. What it certainly does do is it makes some folks hate white people. So such things are disastrously divisive. You know what makes people like black people? Good black people. The Cosby Show did more for the positive perception of black people among white Americans than any propagandist history class ever did. I mean, it's ironic how that turned out, but still true. But here's the thing. This 
demand to end history classes seems outrageous, and yet it's just the tip of the iceberg. I sometimes watch YouTube videos about history, the history of the Saxons in Europe, or the first contact between the Japanese and the West, things like this. The other day, I clicked on a video called What Were Africans Doing in 1492? The title was provocative. What were Africans doing in 1492? After a couple of minutes watching this video, I turned to the screen upon which I was watching it, and I said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Here's the bit that caught my attention. We all know that Christopher Columbus was not the first to sail the Atlantic Ocean, but seldom do we explore when Africans did so. It's said that an African king of the Mali Empire named Abu Bukhari Kita II sailed the Atlantic Ocean long before Columbus, a whole century before him to be exact. Apparently, there's an African king who sailed to the Americas before Columbus. Naturally, I thought, this sounds made up. <laughs> so I checked it out, and sure enough, it's totally made up. It's, it's some kind of insane pseudo-history, and it's bizarre. So I dug a little further to try to see what else I could find out there in the wild west of information we call the internet. And holy crap. The first thing that struck me while I was researching the history of pre-colonial Africa on the internet was that there seemed to be zero references to hunter-gatherer tribes or primitive technological advancement or the lack of written language. On the contrary, if you come to the internet with zero knowledge of African history, a cursory search will leave you with the impression that Africa basically invented everything. Pretty much every article I could find on pre-colonial Africa is in some way trying to counter the prevailing narrative that Africans were primitive compared to the Europeans of the time. But here's the thing. They were primitive. Most sub-Saharan and West African tribes had cultures that were equivalent to those of the Europeans 10,000 years prior. I think we all grew up with this understanding. I mean, you just have to watch a documentary about African tribes from like the 1980s, and you'll see that some of these tribes still live this way, even, even in the 1980s. The deformed lip due to the insertion of discs is rarely seen these days, except in women of the older generation. Tattoos are the clothing of those who go about naked. And the designs are as varied and personal as the women themselves. The November moon lights the sky like a Fali girl's jewelry. The whip symbolically chases away the evil spirits. The moment has come for the young person to renew himself both physically and socially. But the internet won't tell you this anymore. All references to the primitive nature of most African tribes has been erased. Now, there is a whole other history of the world out there being taught to the masses that I was entirely unaware of. It's apparently called Afrocentrism, and it's essentially a racist revision of basically all of history, placing black people at the core of all major development throughout the world. This Afrocentric pseudo-history has apparently been around since the 1960s, but only really started gaining popularity in academia in the 1980s. And according to the Afrocentric view, the first philosophers in the world were African, and all philosophy emerged from Africa. According to the Afrocentric view, the ancient Egyptian pharaohs were all black. And <laughs> actually, I should pause here because this is probably the most hotly contested point of all. There's this whole Wikipedia article dedicated to this controversy. You know, what was the race of the pharaohs of Egypt? Now, when I was a kid, I never heard this question ever asked. I just assumed that they were like Egyptian, right? But apparently scientists aren't sure. It may be that the ruling class of Egypt was made up of a different race than the general population and the slave classes. So then what were they? It seems like every racist on earth has been fighting over this for ages, okay? 
and the Egyptian government, for some reason, won't release the DNA results of any of the pharaohs. And I guess maybe this is because they've discovered that they're not related to modern Egyptians or something like that, and, you know, they want to hide it. I don't know. But whatever the case, Egyptians themselves, they want the pharaohs to be Egyptian. Afrocentrists want the pharaohs to be black, and white supremacists want the pharaohs to be white. And bizarrely, there is some evidence to support the idea that the ancient Egyptian pharaohs were European. Look into it, it's fascinating. But I mean, I'm not sure why everybody cares about this so much. Egyptian pharaoh racial identity is interesting, uh, but I don't think it's that important. It's, it's not gonna change your life one way or the other. I'm not sure why people care that much about it, but people really, really care. But anyway, uh, we don't have definitive proof because, like I said, the Egyptian government is super annoying. But the one thing that we are sure about is that the pharaohs definitely were not black. Literally, no Egypt Egyptologist thinks this, and it's been stated with absolute clarity by Egypt's top Egyptologist, Zahi Hawass. Specifically, he was talking about uh, Tutankhamun. But this is like a very serious point for Afrocentrists. Let's go through a couple of more things Afrocentrists think. According to the Afrocentric view, Africans established the entire civilization of ancient Greece. According to the Afrocentric view, Africans established the ancient Qi dynasty of China. According to the Afrocentric view, Africans came to America before Columbus, as I mentioned before, and they established the ancient Olmec culture of Mexico. Now, to understand the actual history of Africa, you have to understand that Africa is a massive continent that has been the home to thousands of different tribes for a very long time. Different regions of Africa have experienced very different rates of advancement. For clarity, Africa is best broken up into six separate regions. North Africa, Saharan Africa, East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. North and East Africa developed more or less at the same rate as the rest of the world. They were connected to the Arabian Peninsula, the Holy Land, and Southern Europe via the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. These are not the ancestors of American slaves. When we're discussing the ancestors of American slaves and their descendants, black Americans today, we're primarily talking about West Africans. These people, as well as those in Central and Southern Africa, are the people we typically think of when we say African, but they are generally they are generally called sub-Saharan Africans. Many Afrocentrists like to claim that all Africans are black and they make no distinction between the various cultures of Africa, but this is aggressively ignorant. For the most part, the West Africans and Central Africans had almost no contact with the outside world for tens of thousands of years. Anthropologists love to study the people of these regions for this very reason. The primitive nature of their cultures provides anthropologists with fascinating insights into humanity and, and gives us clues as to how the ancient people of Europe and the Middle East and the Far East may have lived many thousands of years ago. Now, the foundational idea behind Afrocentrism is the theory that white Europeans needed an excuse to dominate blacks in Africa and to enslave them because, you know, it was an ugly, unethical business to enslave Africans. Now, never mind that the North Africans had been enslaving white Europeans for hundreds of years, or that black Africans had enslaved each other for hundreds of years. But that's all irrelevant to this theory. So, because white Europeans had to find the concept of enslaving other human beings abhorrent, they had to dehumanize the black Africans. And so, the white Europeans went around destroying every bit of evidence of black African history. This is the Afrocentric version of history. This is why they believe you, you can't find any written history or any artifacts of Sub-Saharan Africans. This is what they say. So according to the Afrocentrists, the lack of recorded history wasn't because of the lack of written language or the lack of permanent buildings or tools or other physical remnants throughout Africa because most Africans were hunter-gatherers or semi-pastoral. No, it was because evil white people had insidiously erased the history of black Africans. Now, why am I so outraged by this? Why, why am I so outraged that I actually made a video knowing that any leftist who sees it will immediately scream, racist? That in one moment. First, of course, I have to annoy you with one more short ad. The Second Amendment is under attack. I think that's obvious. You all know what happened to Mark and Patricia McCloskey when they tried to defend their home. We all want to show our support for the Second Amendment. So there's this company, Beyond 
Patriots. And they're giving away this Second Amendment coin for 10 bucks. Here it is. Now, I love coins. So I love this thing. Look at this. This is great. On the back, uh, there's a quote from Samuel Adams. It says, The Constitution shall never be construed to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. I love that. It's a beautiful coin, and it's just a cool thing to have. Normally, this retails for 40 bucks, but they're giving them away for 10 bucks. The best possible way, I think, to show your support for the Second Amendment is buy guns. But uh, adding this to your collection for 10 bucks, I mean, it just looks cool, and it adds something a little shiny and different to your gun case. And it helps support this channel. So if you like this beautiful little coin, click on the link below in the description and pick one up for 10 bucks. It looks cool, you can mount it, it's beautiful. If you like coins and you like guns, Go ahead and get this. Click on the description below. It's just 10 bucks. All right, we're back. So now, why am I so outraged by this? I'm white. I'm a privileged American with a beautiful European heritage that I can research and learn about. Why should I care if black people are exaggerating and distorting a few things about their own history? Couple of reasons. First, and this is less important, but, I, but it still bothers me. I have heard many times black people debate me about, you know, various things, this or that, and they will often include some random fact of history which is obviously false. And I never knew why this happened so much. I, I didn't know about this Afrocentric historical revisionism. Now, if you want to be taken seriously in any discussion, you can't be confidently insisting that Africans established the Greek, Chinese, and Mesoamerican empires. You can't insist that pharaohs were black or that the real Jews were black or things like that. This kind of talk just makes you sound crazy and immediately undermines your credibility or any respect you might have been granted by those with whom you are speaking. Reciting pseudo-history makes you sound like an idiot. Along those same lines, I also just care about the truth and I want everybody to know the truth and I want everybody to sort of agree upon what history was so that we can have reasonable discussions about how to live our lives and you know lessons from history, things like that. All right, now let's get to the second thing. And this is far more important. It's bad that some people believe this stuff. It's worse that some people want all children to be taught an Afrocentric version of history, as we saw at the beginning of this video. And this stuff is already being taught at some universities by some university professors all throughout the country. So it's, it's not as if this is not a real threat. This is a real threat. Infecting the next generation with utterly fake history is unbelievably dangerous. Most of the Black Lives Matter stuff that's going on right now, the Antifa riots, this kind of thing, they all believe that a black genocide is going on right now in America. The numbers, of course, tell a very different story, and yet this complete and utter lie is believed by many of these so-called protesters. And here's the thing. This racial insanity is far worse than just a few kooky Afrocentrists, revisionist historians. Because leftists in academia and the sciences and in journalism and some historians are so indoctrinated by this insane leftist idea that white people are irredeemably racist that they've started to make claims that are just plain false. And again, I'm not talking about fringe theorists. I'm talking about mainstream scientists, like the work of whom ends up being taught in mainstream classrooms and gets repeated on PBS kids shows. The most egregious instance of this that I've heard was the case of the Cheddar Man. Cheddar Man is the skeletal remains of an ancient British man who was found in a cave in Cheddar Gorge in England. After DNA analysis of the specimen, researchers studying Cheddar Man reported to the media, in particular through a Channel 4 documentary in the UK, that Cheddar Man was in fact black. But here's the thing. It was a huge lie. Cheddar Man wasn't black at all. In fact, according to scientists, there is currently no really good way to know his skin color. And here's the really rotten thing. It looks to me, based on the amount of sheer excitement seen among the researchers in the documentary and the confidence with which they are discussing this matter, it looks to me like this is all one massive propaganda campaign. Now, I follow the whole race thing in the UK quite a bit, and because it's pretty outrageous over there, some of the stuff that goes on. And there are some people in Britain that basically want to, the UK to stay predominantly white. And... They're concerned that because of the influx of Pakistanis, Indians, Africans, and people from various other ethnicities, and because of the disproportionately high birth rate among those people, that English people will 
become the minority in England in the coming decades. I think this is actually a legitimate concern. As an Anglophile and a world traveler, I love seeing the different cultures of the world in the different countries. I don't want to go to India and see McDonald's and Starbucks everywhere. I don't want to go to England and see all the signs in Punjabi and mosques all over the place. And listen, this is coming from somebody who, one of my best friends is English Pakistani. He's a Pakistani kid. You know, his, his parents were from Pakistan, but he was born and raised in England. One of the greatest guys I know, right? But I don't want all of England, every sign in England to be in Punjabi. And I don't want to see mosques all over the place. That, that's, I don't think that's unreasonable. I believe that there is a value in preserving cultures. And if you want to move to the UK, I say, that's great. Embrace English culture, embrace British culture. All right. And look, the UK does have a lot of different cultures already, native cultures, some of which have actually been damaged beyond repair by the influx of immigrants. But there are a lot of other people in Britain who have been convinced that any attempt to preserve British identity or Scottish or Welsh or whatever, that these attempts are all, all motivated purely by racist hatred. And so these stupid racists throughout the UK have to be taught that Pakistanis are good people too. And we're all basically one race, the human race. And there aren't really any differences between us. Now, never mind that India has been rated the most racist country on earth. And racism between Pakistanis and Indians have kept them in perpetual war since 1947. Never mind the tens of thousands of white English girls raped by Muslim gangs in the UK. Never mind the attempt by Anjem Chowdhury to establish Sharia law in the UK. Forget all of that. All this multiculturalism stuff it's, it's going great. And if you disagree, you're just an evil white racist. And we all know that no matter what, it's always the white people who are the racists. And so we need to make documentaries to insist to them, those evil people, that they need to be not racist and they need to be good and they need to invite anybody from any race or culture into England and take over. That's what we think. That's, that's what the left thinks in, in the UK. It's disturbing. But that's true. So they make documentaries like this. It's ridiculous. Now, I was listening to a report uh, on the BBC the other day about a gene that allows white Europeans to drink milk, while most of the rest of the world are lactose intolerant. Now, at the beginning of the show, they claim that white supremacists believe that white people are superior because white people can drink milk. And the producers of this show wanted to make very clear that the ability to drink milk does not make anyone superior. It turns out those of us who reach adulthood still being able to drink it are, at least genetically speaking, the odd ones. Many people think, for example, that the only people that are lactase persistent are Europeans. And in fact, there have been some rather bizarre movements amongst white supremacists in the United States where they walk around the streets chugging milk to demonstrate their supposed racial superiority. Of course, they're, as usual, demonstrating nothing but their stupidity, because if they'd read just the smallest amount on this subject, they'd realise that actually this is a trait that's evolved in multiple populations in Africa, in the Middle East, in Southern Asia and other parts of the world. Clearly, there's more to drinking milk than just showing yourself up as a racist. <laughs> but here's the thing. This claim about the white supremacists comes from a video from 2018, which shows some kids, apparently white supremacists, chugging milk. But they're all clearly joking. So in order to combat this non-existent problem of white people feeling superior because of their milk digesting superpower, the host of the show felt the need to derisively characterize those who can process lactose as mutants. People who can drink milk as adults have an alteration in the stretch of DNA that normally turns lactase off when it's no longer needed. In fact, if you can drink milk as an adult, you're the mutant, if you want to put it like that. And OK, this is a minor point of irritation for sure. But here's the thing. I hear this kind of crap all the time from the left. It's not just the derisive way in which she's trying to characterize white people, but it's the racism hysteria that's being perpetrated here. White people are not racist. I'm sorry. There's just so few of these 
racist people in the world that's essentially a non-existent problem. There was a study done in 2013 which determined the most and least racist countries in the world. And what they found was that all of the white English-speaking countries, the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, etc., as well as the Scandinavian countries and most of Europe, these were the least racist countries on Earth. Where are the most racist countries? India, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. But no matter what the data shows, for whatever reason, this myth persists of the evil racist white man. Recently, historians have revised the history of Abraham Lincoln. A common argument I hear about Lincoln is that he didn't really care about black slaves. He, he just wanted to keep the South from seceding. A single line from a letter written by Lincoln is almost always quoted as evidence of his indifference. The line reads as follows. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And it's true. When trying to figure out how to save the Union, he did write this. It lacks context or nuance when it's presented alone, but that's the quote, and that's the only thing, mind you, that's used to support the claim that Lincoln did not care about freeing the slaves. However, everyone who makes this claim neglects the gazillion other quotes by Lincoln utterly condemning slavery. How about this letter to Lincoln's friend Joshua Speed, a slave owner in Kentucky? He writes, you know I dislike slavery. You may remember, as I well do, that from Louisville to the mouth of the Ohio, there were on board 10 or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons. That sight was a continued torment to me. It's hardly fair for you to assume that I have no interest in a thing which has and continually exercises the power of making me miserable. As a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it'll read, all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. When it comes to this, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty. To Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. The idea that Lincoln was indifferent to slavery is pure pseudo history. If you believe this, then you're just uneducated. You need to read up a little on Lincoln. They've also gone after Columbus. This article from CNN says, why Columbus wasn't the hero we learned about in school. What you hear from critics of Columbus was that he was the cause of a genocide of indigenous people here in the Americas. This is, of course, totally false. This is another example of pure pseudo-history. There is an enormously complex set of reasons why people believe this particularly insidious revision of history, but I assure you, Columbus was the hero we learned about in school. And if you're too young to have been taught that Columbus was a hero, you heard it here first. Columbus was a freaking hero. Pseudo-history is destroying people's perceptions of the past. It's destroying the history of Europeans, and it's destroying our perceptions of our own culture. Well, that's it for me. And remember, it's not that our liberal friends are ignorant. It's just that they're trying to erase history. Welcome to 1984. Good night. But together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you.